Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. And thanks for joining us this evening, August 6, 2013. You're listening to The Truth Denied. Uh, Of course, I'm your host, Roxy Lopez. I feel like we're one big family here on this Revolution Network. It's awesome. Hello, chat room. If you have any questions for the guests tonight, go ahead. What do you do? You know what to do. Uh, just post them and, and our producer will pick them up for us. You know, um, before I introduce our guests this evening, um, we have some strange goings on in the world right now. One of them right here in Arizona, very peculiar uh, weather. You know, we've got some real thick cloud layer, which is part of monsoon weather and some rain which is you know we welcome the rain here we're in a you know 10 12 year drought so all of that's pretty groovy i like it um our temperatures drop from the 120s down to 79 in the day i think that's uh bizarre for southern Cal- uh, southern arizona but here's what's more more bizarre We've got this cloud layer that's way up there. You know, uh, it's not real low. It's not surfacing like the mountaintops or anything like that. And um, all day long, we've been hearing like craft, some type of craft. And it's so loud, it sounds like what would be thunder uh, during monsoon. But it's not thunder because you can hear it pass over, you know, from horizon to horizon about five minutes of this really loud jet engine. And that's been going on all day, and it's been going on all over the state. Any of you out there from Arizona listening, if you're having this occur in different parts of Arizona, can you chat that into the chat room? Because I'd like to know. I did get a report from northern Arizona, and uh, they were saying that uh, three nights in a row, they're getting heavy chemtrailing at night only, and um, what's interesting, that was in the area, if you all remember, of the fires, the Prescott and Yarnell fires, the Yarnell fires that killed uh, 19 uh, firefighters. And speaking of that, very sad thing evolving out of that or devolving is that the firefighters, the hot shots, they called them, the you know uh, expert teams that lost their lives uh, that one tragic evening up in Yarnell when the town of Yarnell burned down. Uh, Some of the wives have been going, uh, the wives of these deceased men have been going on uh, mainstream media and and talking about how they're not getting the insurance coverage or the benefits that their husbands had. Um, there's some sort of debacle going on there. I don't know. I'll keep you up to date on it. But that, you know, was such a huge national story that was covered at least for a couple of weeks on all across the board media um, to have this come out of it, you know, when these guys were the elite firefighters and these young wives with babies are are not getting the benefits that the death benefits. So I'm going to keep my eye on this and that's something to pay attention anyway to because um I think we wouldn't this story wouldn't have seen the light of day if it hadn't have been such a big story to begin with. So we don't know how often this has happened. I know that the 911 responders families had some of the same tragedies when it came to the benefits for the wives or the husbands of those deceased. So if you know anything about it, go ahead and chat that in and uh, my producer will pick it up for me. I'm very interested. Or just write me at info at the truth denied dot com. That's info 
at thetruthdenied.com, and I will look into it. Our team will look into that situation. I want to know more about it. Let me tell you, this month is something else uh, for many reasons, a lot of culminations and crossroads and and just a lot of information coming together. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know what it is about August. August is just heavy, really heavy. And um, we have upcoming shows. If you want to take a look at uh, who's coming up this month, go ahead and go to the Truth Denied uh, uh, website. Uh, That's truthdenied.com. And I'll drop in a link for all of you. You might want to bookmark it for the future. A lot of people do. And go ahead and take a look at uh, some of the guests we have coming up this month. Um, again, this is uh, for some reason we've got major UFO stories um, from people coming, you know, forward. Uh, this Friday we have a lovely gentleman by the name of Max Spears who's going to come on and sp- explain a few things uh, to us that we really need to be in the know about. And he is a whistleblower, so. Uh, uh, Max is the real deal, and I appreciate him taking the time. Of course, on the 13th, we've got Stephen Bissett, and you all know, you know, he's, Stephen is under scrutiny right now. Um, he's with the Paradigm Research Group, and he's going to talk about UF dis- UFO disclosure and the citizens' hearing, and there's just a real polarized view on Mr. Bissett at this point. So, um I think that'll be a very enlightening show. Steve is very business-minded. I know that he's got contracted quite a bit of money donated to do a documentary, and we'll talk about that, you know, what he's going to be doing. And then, of course, on the 16th, we have a gentleman. Actually, we have four individuals who are going to be on the show. Uh, The main gentleman is by the name of Mark Eddy. And we're going to talk about fracking. This is someone who worked in the fracking industry. We're also going to talk to somebody, get this, who is in the fracking industry real high up in management. He's he's actually going to come on the show. And this is going to be fascinating. Two others who also cover fracking, which has become a really big concern in this country for a number of reasons. I'll leave the 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 show to speak for itself, but I do have a lot of questions. Um, and then, of course, on the twentieth, we have two of the world's you know uh, biggest chemtrail activists, Mr. Paul Mack of Australia and Max Bliss of France. And uh, you might recognize those names because, boy, are they out there making changes in the world. And um, uh, and then on the 30th, we're going to also have aviation expert who hasn't been on the show in about a year, Mark McCandlish, with pilot Stephen Knusel. And Stephen Knusel has his take on chemtrails after being a pilot as a career for his life. Um, And Mark McCandlish, aviation expert, who also flew some of the very exotic craft and uh, actually uh, still works in the field, uh, he has his take on chemtrails. And uh, the show is not to be an argumentative show. They both have opposite opinions. And so we want to portray the show, give you both sides of this argument. And I think that's only going to benefit all of us. It's the show is to enlighten and not confuse. So I really look forward to that show. I'm very curious uh, uh, as to hearing what Stephen Knusel has to say. And then, of course, I'm interested to hear what Mark McCandlish has to say about what Stephen Knusel's point of view is. This is going to be a fascinating show. We've got other people lined up as well for August. Just check out the schedule page. My guest this evening, uh, we welcome him back to the show. His name is Len Wallach, and he's an astrologer, and of course, he's very informed about August and the remainder of the year, as well as the past quarter, and he's going to fill us in on some interesting uh, astrological uh, aspects that are going on and why people are feeling a certain way and perhaps some solutions uh, as well. If you want to check him out, just go to thetruthdenied.com. He's all linked up. Len is a regular contributor to Planet Waves Astrology, which is planetwaves.net. I don't know if any of you are um, 
part of uh, reading that website or members of it. Um, and that website was published by Eric Francis, also a practicing astrologer in Seattle, Washington. And as you all know, I lived in Seattle for <clears throat> roughly 14 years, and uh, it, it's it's quite the place and culmination of individuals and um, with this type of background as well. So very cool place when it comes to astrology. Uh, Len provides astrology readings and instruction via telephone or in person. So if you want to contact him, uh, he is available for you. For the last 10 years, Len also assisted Michael Soriano in transmitting the Reiki Mastery Series teaching model, which was uh, matriculated over 100 practicing Reiki masters. So real good stuff there. Len grew up watching the sky and to this day finds the greatest joy contemplating stars, planets, and luminaries from the sacred surface of the earth. And uh, without any further ado, I really look forward to this interview this evening. Uh, let's bring you on, uh, Len Wallach. Len, welcome to the show and thanks for making the time. Thank you, Roxy. Uh, I very much appreciate the chance to be your guest again. Awesome. Yeah, it's it likewise. So, uh, Len, let's um, you know start with um, you know what's with August. Um, why is August uh, so under the radar? I mean, we're getting anything from the world's going to end in August. Uh, timeline conversions are happening in August. The negative timeline and the positive are smashing into each other in August. Um, just a number of controversial August stories. And some people are tripping. I mean, they're they're really afraid that the world's literally, literally going to end. Um, what can you, can you speak to us about this and help us to understand, is August significant or is this just fear porn? Well, uh, thank you, Roxy. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, remembering today's place in history. Um, it was on this day that uh, the people of Hiroshima, Japan, uh, endured the first nuclear attack at the hands of the United States. And it's uh, something that we should uh, remember uh, because those who do not remember history are often destined to repeat it, and it's, that's the kind of thing we don't want to repeat. Now, as regards to um, uh, August, there are uh, there is a lot of activity. Uh, today is the new moon. As a matter of fact, the, the moon uh, was con conjoined with the sun in terms of longitude uh, about two hours ago. So we are starting a new lunar cycle right now. And there is a lot of activity in the area of where the new moon is. Um, there uh, is uh, the, the sun and the moon today are in the sign Leo, in the tropical sign Leo. They're conjoined there, so it's a Leo new moon. And in the preceding sign of Cancer, uh, there are uh, there's Jupiter and Mars. And Mercury, which has just gotten out of out of retrograde and is in the latter degrees of uh, Mercury today. Uh, so, when you consider the area between Cancer and Leo, it's kind of like the uh, fulcrum of the zodiac because Cancer is ruled by the Moon. And Leo is ruled by the sun. And the sun and the moon are, the, of course, the two biggest, brightest things in the sky. In the sky. And uh, and when there's a big collection of things in those two places, there's a feeling of of, uh, of intensity because the sun and moon are intense, uh, and both in their gravity and in their brightness. And there's also a, a sense of things being kind of at the fulcrum, at a tipping point. The main thing, however, is that there is reason to feel good about the way things are going, even though there is a lot of fear or fear mongering going on right now. Okay. Um, you know, one aspect of this, Len, would be that 
um, you know, there's discussion, uh, even in mainstream commentators uh, and hosts uh, are talking about the Middle East, our mm-hmm. relationship with Russia, mm-hmm. uh, Snowden, of course, and, and I think you, you can comment to that, um, mm-hmm. and um, the idea that World War Three is on the horizon. Mm-hmm. Is is that fear mongering or can you sort help us to sort through that so that we can see better? Um, you know, I think that's a pretty powerless feeling for humanity to think that the war rooms of the world are cooking up a World War Three and that we can't stop it. So let's let's speak to that for a moment. Well, first of all, I don't know anybody in the war rooms of the world, so I I can't say for sure what we are doing. But ever since Hiroshima, we have lived under the shadow of uh, of a potential uh, for a very destructive war. As um, Albert Einstein said, uh, when somebody asked him about World War III, he says, well, he wasn't sure how that would turn out. But if there was a World War IV, it would be fought with sticks and stones because that would be about all that would be left. And we've been living with this for a long time. And uh, there are times when the uh, fear uh, reaches a peak and then it kind of levels out. I was alive during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It was a very, very scary time. Uh, when the world uh, was uh, a much closer in, in terms of uh, visible evidence to the brink of war, uh, uh, nuclear war, than we are now. Uh, so the main thing to remember is that we should not put energy into these things individually. We should think of ourselves as contributors one way or another. If we contribute to fear by either fearing or transmitting our fear to other people, then we're working against what our uh, our best interests are. If we contribute to helping people understand that there are alternatives, that there have been times in the past like this that we have gotten through, and that we are living at a time when things are changing for the better in many ways, then it will feed, take take the energy away from that which uh, we're terrified of. And it's it's one of those things that if you spend a lot of time worrying about something, uh, it will contribute to it happening. If you don't spend a lot of time worrying about about something uh, and put your energy elsewhere, you will be contributing to having other things happen besides that, what you're worried about. So we all have a role to sure. play in, in that. Do you think, Len, that we're going through a time where it's advantageous to change or alter our belief systems? I think that we're uh, going through a time when uh, it's uh, that uh, belief systems are actually uh, going through a transition. Um, This involves, of course, some very, very long periods of time, very, very long cycles, and so it's hard to have perspective. But I do think that one of the things the astrology indicates is that there is a a rise or return, if you will, of the divine feminine taking place, and that's going to offer us some options or alternatives for a long, long time now. The major religions of the world have been predominantly uh, emphasizing the divine masculine, and that has influenced how people view themselves and how people view their world. For example, uh, in religions dominated by the divine masculine, there's a tendency to uh, kind of uh, view oneself as uh, being flawed, uh, there's uh, there are a couple well-known religions that talk about human beings born into sin, you know, uh, in debt, so to speak, uh, from the very beginning. 
uh, and and uh, encouraging human beings to walk around thinking of themselves as being sinful, regardless of uh, what any human being may have done, and kind of being down on oneself. And then, of course, the divine masculine also perpetuates a worldview that says things like kill or be killed or eat or be eaten. And if that is the worldview and personal view that you have, your options are kind of going to be kind of limited. They're going to be limited within your own mind. They're going to be limited within the culture uh, that you live and in the nation that you live. And the divine feminine uh, seems to be uh, coming forward and offering some alternatives uh, with a different worldview of self-acceptance and uh, valuing oneself and uh, seeing the world as someplace other than a, than, uh, a place where one's life uh, is sustained at the cost of another one's life and, and, and values of such things as cooperation. So one of the things that seems to be happening right now uh, is, is uh, there are some alternatives appearing, and you see it all around. Yeah, you see people having alternative forms of orientation toward gender. You see people having alternative forms of orientation toward economics. And the uh, established order, of course, has found it to be very profitable for the past couple thousand years or so to perpetuate a, a pernicious form of divine masculine, and uh, because there's not uh, divine masculine isn't all bad, uh, and it isn't inherently bad. And then for those who uh, uh, are atheists, I wanted to also show my respect for them uh, by discussing things like the divine feminine or divine masculine. My mind is open, of course, to the fact that the divine is simply a human construct. And uh, uh, Madeline Murray O'Hare, who was perhaps the most famous atheist in the 20th century, did a lot to contribute to civil liberties of people in America. Uh, and so the main thing is having an open mind, having more options and alternatives to work with, and being able to find one's own way in um, uh, through the world rather uh, than living someone else's values, uh, someone else's worldview. Uh, and and we're, we're seeing that happen. We're seeing that happen all over the world. And people get it on a very fundamental level. So there's reason to see things uh, 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 with, a, with a, a more optimistic eye uh, right now. Um, and 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 that's that's a beautiful thing, and, and I'm in agreement with you that optimism is starting to come in, into play, which is, is bizarre because the world seems to be at this <clears throat> us against them type of mentality, um, especially when the activists, you know, when we all started to really get on the front lines a few years ago, it it felt like the us against them and. And the part of the evolution of, of many activists that I know has to become focusing on a good outcome. Uh, the, the word you, you used, which I love, is cooperation. How do we cooperate? How do we, and, and how do we uh, get out of the us against them? Because that's a, that's a real um, toxic mindset. Well, getting out of the essay against them um, uh, has to do with uh, not seeing uh, the world as a place with limited resources where everybody is going to be competing for them and there's only going to be a few winners, but rather seeing the world as a place where the limited resources can be sufficient if there is equal distribution of those resources. Um, the, uh, it's a common knowledge ever since the Occupy movement and their 
99% versus 1% uh, motif that mm-hmm. uh, a great deal of the resources of the world are in the hands of very few people. Uh, and if that situation were resolved, uh, then there would be a great deal more for everybody as long as there was, was an agreement that uh, it was not necessary for a few people to have uh, control over everything, as long as there was an ability to evolve beyond greed. And uh, this has to do a lot with... Uh, and thanks for joining us this evening, Len. We were just talking about the divine feminine. And before we move forward with that, I'd like to ask, has there ever been a time in history where the divine feminine did rule and then it changed to the masculine? Well, thank you. Thank you for uh, mentioning that. Um, As far as anthropologists and archaeologists can tell, there was a time when the divine feminine was predominant. It was probably uh, on the order of uh, uh, more than 5,000 years ago. And the uh, thing that happened was there was a shift uh, in, uh, uh, in, in values uh, in terms of uh, being able to uh, instead of be productive and to have a society that was based upon production, uh, it was found that it could be uh, a pretty efficient way to go if you simply conquered productive societies and, and, and took their stuff. And, of course, the whole thing of conquest uh, uh, and war um, uh proved to be very successful, and uh, that, in part, ushered in uh, an era uh, with the uh, divine masculine. It appears also that there's even longer cycles, and this is one of these things where we're speculating, but it has been speculated that there are cycles that not only alternate between the interpretation of the being of the divine being predominantly feminine or masculine there's also longer cycles be, uh, between interpretations of the divine being in one spirit or being or in many spirits or being and, and, and that seems to go in cycles as well and these long cycles go back beyond written history and beyond uh, what uh, uh, we've been able to discern from uh, the anthropologists and archaeolo- archaeologists have done such a good job of helping us understand what we do understand. Uh, but it appears to be a cyclical thing. And uh, the, we're right now kind of at that at fulcrum, uh, that tipping point of, uh, in the cycle where the old order is not going to go quietly. But the uh, new order, so to speak, is uh, irresistible. So you've got, you know, an irresistible uh, force and an immovable object. And that can be kind of scary uh, to be going through that, especially when one is invested uh, in a particular order of things that appears to be on the way out. And that can make everything look bad. But the main thing is that the cycles is uh, is the key here. Things go through cycles, day and night, seasons, and some very uh, and some much longer cycles as well. Sure, understood. Um, you know, just uh, for the listening audience, um, the divine feminine is not speaking to women. The divine feminine is about the divine energy the, that we all have, men and women alike. Is, is that is that true? That's correct. All of us have uh, uh, some feminine components in our personalities, in our lives, uh, and all of us have some masculine components regardless of gender. And the uh, integration 
uh, is uh, evident in, in the world where you have all of these people who, are, especially young people, who are exploring the uh, uh, areas, the gray areas between the polarities. And you have many uh, young people who are uh, exploring uh, in this particular life, this particular incarnation, various forms of, uh, uh, of transgender lifestyle uh, and, 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 and also uh, experimenting with different things. And I think that's really all too good. I think that's furthering human evolution uh, and allowing us to have more options, more tools, more strategies, and a broader range of values in order to get along in the world. It absolutely makes sense. Uh, and, and, you know, thanks for sharing about the, the change uh, that we're going through and the changes um, and being uprooted uh, in our belief systems. Um, and you can see that happening globally. Um, it, it's, it's, I think change in itself causes stress um, for any of us. And uh, we're we're sort of having to go through the changes because what you said, you know, the old stuff is not really working, you know, and who wants to be stressed and, you know, all of these social practices, like if you work 80 hours a week, you're successful, you know, uh, we're starting to give it up, we're starting to realize that, if I'm working 80 hours a week, it's going to be because I love what I do, like playing music or doing astrology like you, Lynn, or making documentary films. Or people are starting to go back to their roots of their passion and starting to break away, if you will, from this, this paradigm. Well, yeah, that's true. Um, the long-term astrology that's going on, we have this Uranus-Pluto square. Uh, that's lasting for years, being repeated seven times over three years, so it's essentially a continuum, and that represents big changes in the world and in people's individual lives and where people's individual lives intersect with the world. And we have this water trine that's going on that we discussed last time that is uh, representing uh, an opportunity for us to kind of integrate into acceptability, our intuitions, our emotions, things that are usually, uh, you know, sorted out or filtered out. We used the example of Jimi Hendrix last time who integrated uh, feedback and distortion into his art rather than trying to sort it out or filter, uh, filter it out. And therefore, he had a greater palette to work with and was able to be more expressive and more creative. And that's an, uh, an opportunity that's available right now. And then that water trine that's going on for about a year uh, uh, became part of a sextal, uh, uh, a configuration on the zodiac that's kind of like a six-pointed star with a trine in the earth signs. And water and earth signs are considered to, by astrologers, most Western astrologers, they know, to be the feminine signs. So you had all the feminine signs hooked together at the end of last month uh, uh, in a configuration. It doesn't happen every year. It, 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 it happens uh, quite seldom, as a matter of fact. And that was something that happened right at the end of July, on July 29th. And all of this thing, all of these things, since astrology is symbolic, we have cycles, we have patterns within the cycles. Astrology is observation, of, of those patterns and cycles in correlation to to uh, events in one's life and events in the world, there seems to be as part of that an indicator that uh, the uh, uh, the divine feminine is uh, making a resurgence, and that's all to the good. Not because the divine masculine is bad, and not uh, to offend anybody who doesn't believe in anything divine but because it indicates more options, more alternatives, because one's, what, what, the way one gets along in the world, a lot of it comes from their spiritual framework. And if the spiritual framework 
uh, is is more open to uh, to options, and your life will be more open to options, and you won't feel like you're in a corner or being pushed over the edge. Uh, but rather, you'll feel like there's there's elbow room. There's there there are other ways uh, to to go about things when certain things don't work. Understood. And, you know, you'd mentioned in an email to me um, that uh, you you were going to evaluate how far we have come in the last three months. Um, And Mm -hmm. so can you can you share that like just the last three months? Yeah, sure. Well, uh, three months ago, approximately three months ago, we went to an eclipse cycle. Uh, uh, April 25th, there was a, a lunar eclipse, followed on May 9th or 10th, depending on your time zone, by a solar eclipse, and then another lunar eclipse on May 25th. Okay. Now, if people listening will think back in their lives what their life was like before April 25th, okay? Uh, it's very likely that it will be pretty astonishing how far uh, things have progressed, how far things have come. In the world in general, for example, uh, before we entered this eclipse cycle, nobody knew who Edward Snowden was. Nobody knew, (laughs) except the people he was working for uh, and and, uh, family members and friends. He was not a public figure. Now he's a huge public figure, and what he has done has changed the way the world looks to us. And uh, that's the kind of thing that eclipses do. Eclipses are sort of like that scientific notion of a wormhole where you go in one side and travel what appears to be a short distance and you come out on the other side and you're actually clear on the other side of the galaxy or, 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 or further away from, than that from where you started. And, and uh, this particular eclipse cycle that went from April 25th to May 25th was very much like that. If you look at your life before April 25th and look at your life after May 25th, if you look at public events before uh, and after May 25th, the world really changed it and it made a, a, a lot of change in a short period of time. And we've come a long way in a short period of time. And, and uh, that sort of thing can feel kind of scary because stability is something that a lot of people strive for in their lives. Uh, and to have a lot of change in a short period of time can incite fear. But I think we're better off now that we know uh, what we did not know before about how the United States government and its mega corporate contractors are uh, harvesting huge amounts of data about uh, who we are and what we do, about our identity and activities, um, and and the implications of that. It's better to know than not to know, because knowing, knowledge is, is a form of power. It's not the only form of power, but knowledge is a form of power. So we are more empowered now than we were before these eclipses. And we have some more eclipses coming up this autumn. Uh, It's a more traditional cycle of two eclipses that uh, will begin uh, on uh, October 18th uh, uh, with a lunar eclipse. And uh, uh, after that, a, a, a November 3rd, a solar eclipse. And we can probably look forward to uh, another leap uh, forward in terms of uh, how we experience the world, and we can probably look forward to it as being a good thing because uh, these leaps forward uh, contribute to uh, uh, our advancement or our evolution, and uh, uh, it. But it's, it, it can be a little scary sometimes. It can be, uh, you know, you're in one place one day, and boom, the whole world is different uh, a month later or two weeks later. 
and, uh, and and eclipses can feel that way. But what's being accelerated, I think, is uh, something that's uh, good for the individuals and good for humanity as a whole. Understood. I think some of the complaints that I do Are get. You here? Yes. <laughs> yes, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, I sure can. Okay, great. Um, I think some of the um, concerns and complaints um, that I, I seem to be getting more than anything, and maybe you can speak to this. Uh, some people are questioning their sanity, like they don't know where the middle ground is on their sanity because they say that they don't know who to believe anymore, whether it comes to mainstream news, alternative news, uh, programs like mine, um, you know, reading books, watching documentaries. What's happening is there's so much influx of information that it's actually starting to overload people, and mm -hmm. then they're just going like, Ugh, I don't know anything anymore. What is that? Um, what exactly is that? And how does one, during these times, what do we do to keep our sanity? Are we supposed to just allow, let go? It's going to pass. It doesn't matter. Um, you know, uh, because again, the old paradigm suggests read more, become more, you know, um, uh, in, a, in a particular subject matter, um, look into it, analyze it, you know, and all of this suddenly isn't really working. It's getting us more confused. So what what should we do? Because we're in sort of a volatile sort of condition because the as you described, these eclipses, these cycles that keep you know coming together, uh, they're relentless, the quickening, if you will. Right. It's, right? So what do we do? Hello? Okay. Are we on the air? Okay. We're still on the air, folks, so just hang in there. We lost Mr. Wallach. Maybe he hung up and thought that he wasn't on the air anymore. That's okay. Are you there, Rocky? Yes, Lynn. What happened? I don't know. The call uh, got dropped. I'm not sure whether it was on your end or my end. Mm, it was that's my end. fine. That's fine. Uh, you know, well, you're asking what what do we do? Okay, well, the sanity and all the rest, and how do we know what what navigates us right now? Well, one thing we don't want to do is hide, you know, under the bed. We don't want to put our uh, head in the ground like the proverbial ostrich. We need to be able to exercise some discernment and judgment, first of all, as regards to uh, how we feel and how we think. We need to be able to, before we act on how we feel, uh, we need to sub subject it to some verification by our thinking part of our mind. And then before acting on how we think, we need to ask ourselves how we feel about it and listen to it and give equal balanced weight to both our feelings and intuitions on the one hand and our intellect uh, on the other. Now, you spoke of the great volume of information. Well, this is nothing new, but the main thing is being able to discern what information is uh, uh, basically designed to tr base, uh, get you under somebody's control and what information is good. Uh, to give an example right now, um, right now the uh, sun is in the, the process of flipping its magnetic poles. This is something that has happened before. Uh, it has actually been observed four times previously uh, in, uh, in, uh, in history uh, by scientists. It, uh, since, uh, four times since 1976, it happens about once every 11 years. So that is a fact, and it's kind of exciting that, uh, because we're still learning about it and what it means um, but we've been through it three times before, so we know it doesn't mean the end of the world. But when somebody takes that fact and adds additional things onto it, uh, and every additional thing makes things more likely, then you have to take into account 
probability. Now, I do not use the word impossible because nothing's impossible. If somebody says something is impossible, they're probably wrong. But probability is a good thing to use in terms of judgment. For example, you've got a chat room on your show. Um, am I correct about that? Yes. Okay, so listeners can go, okay, let's use a little example here. Let's say somebody contacts your show uh, on the chat room and says, uh, I'm the Dalai Lama. Okay, well, you know, not impossible. I mean, Dalai Lama's a cool guy. You've got a cool show. Uh, he might want to listen to it, right? But if somebody on the chat room says, I'm the Dalai Lama, and I'm sitting here around my kitchen table with Abraham Lincoln, Superman, Batman, and President Obama, then you start to think, okay, well, probability is pretty low, right? Okay. So to exercise some judgment here in terms of uh, uh, when you hear uh, um, that, uh, that uh, the sun is flipping its magnetic poles as it is right now as we're talking, um, uh, uh, that's probably true. But if you hear that the sun is flipping its magnetic poles and this and that and that, and it all, this all means that, then you start to say, well, wait a minute, the, this is getting into the realm of low probability. And everybody has the ability to exercise judgment as to how probable everything is. And that, I, that is what I would say uh, there, there are the two protocols. Use your judgment. How probable is something that you're hearing or reading? And then also um, keep tabs on yourself. Uh, if you are feeling something very strongly emotionally or an intuitive, an, on an intuitive level, then subject that to some sort of verification on the intellectual level. level. Or if you think you know something intellectually, ask yourself, how do I feel about that? And then listen to your feelings and have the, the feelings and the intellect working together in a balanced way. And that would be a way that I would say to address these times when there's a great deal of information, some of it design, designed to confuse. And, uh, and that is think probability and examine your feelings with your intellect and examine your intellect with your feelings and you will find your way through. People uh, are a, a lot smarter than most of us give ourselves credit for and if you have that kind of framework to work with, you should be able to find your way through. Right. And, and, and you know, it sounds like what, uh, what you're saying is, is keep it simple. Um, uh -huh. Use right. I mean, you know, keep it simple. And by the way, just in relationship to what you were talking about with the 11-year cycle of the sun, um, you know, some of the reports that I was uh, viewing and getting from the public, you know, um, anywhere from sunspot activity um, slowing down, uh, and then and then a gigantic chunk. You know, uh, NASA had provided a a photo of a gigantic what looks to be a gigantic crater on the sun, like just a big piece of it fell off and where did uh -huh. it go? You know, that kind of stuff. So there's the physical, you know, that, and there were lots of rumors about that chunk heading for earth and what have you. And, and that scientists are, you know, don't know what to make of this. And are we approaching another ice age and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And this is erratic behavior and they've never seen it before. And is the sun dying and blah and blah and blah. I mean, this is like, you know, people picking up chunks of news and then kind of filling in the rest with nonsense, you know, like mm -hmm. nothing really to support it. At mm -hmm. the same time, I would like to ask you, um, important that you underlined how do, how do we feel? Um, mm -hmm. Feeling about a situation is, I think, the strongest indication when something's happening, and then like what you said, feeling something very strongly um, it, it, about anything. And and mm -hmm. I don't know about you, Len, but if the sun was going to crash into the earth, 
um, I feel like they're, I'm powerless and there's nothing I can do about it. So I, that's not one of the events I, I tend to worry about because <laughs> I wouldn't be able to do anything anyway. So I, I just, right. right? Um, so that I think is um, one way for uh, folks to address anything uh, that's really big and obnoxious and, and polar shifts of the moon and the sun and the earth. And, you know, if these types of things occur, uh, you know, we're pretty powerless o over that experience. But the cycle of the sun at this point, um, this 11-year cycle that's wrapping up, do you, do you know when it's supposed to be over by any chance, that cycle? Well, according to uh, um, some people at Stanford University's Wilcox Solar Observatory, uh, it, it's it's uh, very well underway. According to one of the uh, scientists there, the North Pole has already basically shifted over, and the South Pole is racing to catch up. And uh, and he said soon, however, both poles will be reversed. And the second half of the solar maximum will be underway. But the main thing we're looking okay, at so that's here is... Okay, so that's, that's our sun. And that started, you said, today? That well, shift? no, this, 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 this has been going for a while. Oh. Uh, um, uh, according, uh, uh, it's been happening for uh, in the process for at least a month. And uh, uh, one of the researchers at Stanford University says it looks like we're no more than three to four months away from the complete field reversal uh, of the sun's magnetic field. It's a big, the sun's really big, it's a star, so for it to go through this process takes, takes months. Um, but it's, we're, we're in the process right now, it's, it's, it's happening. And, uh, uh, but, the, but the main thing is, you know, we've only seen this happen three times before uh, in terms of observing it and knowing what we're looking at. And that's true of so many things, uh, especially in regards to uh, things uh, astronomical, uh, is that we have a limited amount of data, and we have to remember that. And we have to remember that we're learning new things all the time as new observations come in. This process the sun is going through now will probably provide us with a lot of information that was not provided by the three times before that it's gone through it that we've been observing it and knowing what we're looking for. And thanks again for joining us. We're at the top of the second hour with our guest, Len Wallach. And um, Len, you know, I wanted to uh, ask you about your work um, that you provide uh, with your clients. Can you uh, let us know, like, exactly what you do um, when somebody calls you? What are they calling you for, and what, what information do you provide that client with? Well, every person is different. Every person has a different reason for calling me, and every person's information is going to be different. My main objective is to be of service and provide something that a person can use in their life. What I have found is uh, with speaking with many of my clients when they have been the previous astrologers, they really, you know, they don't really remember anything from it. It didn't do anything to change their life. And I try to do something to empower people to actually um, take uh, the information and provide some tools to them so they can actually work with this astrology on their own uh, and, and make a difference in their life and see how it can make a difference in, in their life. Because astrology is observation and correlation of cycles and patterns. And if you can discern cycles and patterns, it's very much like discerning, if you're out uh, surfing, it, discerning which waves to pick and at what time to get up on your board and ride that wave. Uh, and if someone gives you some information rather than having to learn that from scratch, your progress goes a lot faster. So that's what. But that's the type of service I try to provide is empowering people to feel connected with the cycles uh, of the universe and the sky, to feel connected with the cycles of the, of the seasons on the earth, 
and to realize that our role as human beings is to be the originator of cause and effect so that we can make uh, choices uh, that are informed and make choices that are consistent with uh, our objectives and uh, objectives for other people. Right. For instance, you you write in your entry, a blog entry on August 1st uh, on planetwaves.net, a new moon is the prototypical conjunction. It is the sun and moon sharing the same point on the zodiac, the same longitude in the sky. All conjunctions represent the beginning of a new cycle for the two objects involved. Can you talk to us a little bit more about that, um, how that plays into, let's say, a client who comes to you at this point, when, in other words, when this new moon is just coming into play and, you know, you're going to, do what would you you know there are some concrete things that you would share with that person in other words remind them that they're in a new cycle and why is it so important for us to know um for ourselves our individual each template if you will for the individual to know what is coming up uh, what, what what do do people see the relevance of oh don't start something new wait for this date and then proceed do people find value in that well the number one thing is realizing that you and i and anybody else listening out there we are not separate from the world and the universe we're part of it and realizing that means that the cycles that we observe in the world and the universe, we're part of those as well. We're born into them. We're adapted to them. Our DNA uh, it, it has uh, come down through the generations, uh, uh, being subjected to those cycles. The cycles of the seasons are easy to connect with. There's a saying by the, the British, I believe, says there's no such thing as bad weather. There's only inappropriate clothing. Okay? Now, it's dressing appropriate for the weather will contribute to your, to your comfort. Uh, so you, you change uh, what, how you dress with the cycles of the seasons. You often change how you eat. You change a lot of the things that you do with the cycles of the seasons. Well, the cycles of the planets are only one step removed from that. And we're no less connected to them. It's just quite as evident. It's uh, it's a, it's a, because it's one step removed. Now, of course, if you have to do something now and today, you have to do what you have to do, and regardless of what the astrology says. But you should be aware that there are probably some consequences that go uh, with going against cycles or against the flow. And if you're prepared to accept those things, that's just as, uh, just as uh, uh, important as being able to go with the cycles or go with the flow. Going back many, many years, farmers, for example, would, uh, would plant on a new moon. Uh, and uh, that method would got passed down from one generation of farmers to another uh, because it was successful. If it wasn't successful, the the new generation would be told, well, I tried planning on the new moon, but that didn't work, so don't do that. But that that didn't happen. Uh, so for many, many years back, going back, planning on the new moon was, was a good thing. So if I see a client where there is a conjunction, and what I mean by prototypical conjunction is that we can see the sun and moon. They're part of our everyday lives. Uh, and so uh, other conjunctions that involve other planets that are not so e easily seen emulate the example that we see in our lives from the sun and moon. So if somebody has a conjunction, I would say, well, this, you know, this represents a beginning. And they, these are some of the options you might want to look at as far as uh, uh, making the best use of that uh, symbolic beginning in your life and uh, then I leave it to the client to 
to, de- to decide what to do. I don't tell my clients what to do. I lay out the options. I lay out the alternatives. Uh, my, my role is basically say, here you are on the map of life. These appear to be your options and alternatives and it's for you to choose. So do all the, all roads lead to Rome on this map? In other words, you know, um, and I'll use Seattle as a, as a point of reference for the map. Let's say, is this very similar uh, from somebody who's coming from Edmonds uh, and they want to come into uh, Queen Anne, let's say. And so you can tell them three or four different routes, the fastest one, the one that has the least amount of traffic, or you can take this, or you can take the freeway, or you can take the viaduct, or you can take this. Is it similar, like all ro- roads will lead, will get you to Seattle? Uh, some are probably safer, better, faster than others, but you're going to get there anyway. Is that is that? Do you see a similarity in that? Well... Not all roads do, but there are, you know, certain roads do lead to a certain place. There are options uh, about going, say, from San Francisco to Seattle, but most of those options would be roads going north, okay? You, it, it would be a rather long trip to go <laughs> south from San Francisco and get to Seattle, uh, even though it's not impossible. Uh, so th- that option... Uh, you know, if you want to go down to Tierra del Fuego uh, and, and across the Antarctic and then come up around the other side uh, to, to get to Seattle, it, it's possible to do that. But that would be a lot of trouble uh, unless it was your objective to basically uh, see all those places in between. So it, it, that's why the options are laid out so that the objectives of the client can be served uh, and and the alternatives can provide the client with some ways of determining whether or not uh, uh, they're going just not just from one place to another, but what they want to do in between. Because the journey, of course, is just as important as the destination. Sure. And um, can you uh, speak to a couple of things? I, I'm very curious about this. Um, is, first of all, is Mercury the planet Mercury, the only planet that goes retrograde? No. Um, what retrograde means is either the planet passes us or we pass another planet because the planets are in different sized orbits, okay? So it's kind of like being on a track, okay? Uh, Mercury is, as far as we know, is on the inside track. It's the planet that's closest to the sun. So it goes around the sun about three times for every time we go around the sun. So in other words, it laps us and passes us on the inside track about three times a year. And when that happens, there is a very interesting optical illusion that happens that is very comparable to uh, something that might happen to you on the road you're driving on a road that's parallel to a railroad track. Have you ever done that and kind yeah. of pulled up in your car on a train? Okay. So the train's going on a railroad track. And your car starts to catch up with that train. Uh, you're, you're on a road parallel to the track. So what, what happens is you get closer and start catching up with that train. It looks like the train is slowing down, even though it's not. And then as you start to pass that train, it actually looks like the train's going backwards. You've had that happen. (laughs) Yes. Okay. Well, that's what a retrograde is. It's an illusion. Okay. Uh, Planets don't actually go backwards. And the illusion happens when either the planet Mercury or Venus, which are the two planets inside of our orbit, pass between us and the sun. Or when we pass between the sun and a planet outside of our orbit. There's the illusion of uh, the planet that is either passing us or the planet we're passing uh, looking like it goes backwards for a while. Just like when you're on the road parallel to the railroad track and you catch up with the train and pass it, it looks like the train's going backwards. And those are times, uh, uh, even though it's an illusion, those are times that have meaning. Uh, and the, what, a, what a retrograde usually has in terms of meaning is it's time to 
we view uh, or we structure or uh, uh, any of these words that start with re, like retrograde, okay? Uh, reassess things. And uh, we've recently had a Mercury retrograde in Cancer that lasts a long time. Mercury uh, normally goes to resign in about two weeks, and it's been nine weeks, over two months in Cancer. And that's another reason why a lot of people may be feeling uh, a lot of these uh, uh, feelings of kind of <laughs> kind of being worn down by stuff because Mercury represents, in terms of its archetype, the mind. It represents information, a lot of the subjects you were asking me about before. And so Mercury's been in one sign uh, for, uh, for, for two months. Uh, it's like, you know, you, you've got to go so far in a year. Mercury has to go through 12 signs in a year. And it's, been, uh, it's spending uh, up over six months in signs that have to do with water. So, and that involves a lot of emotion. Water involves a lot of emotion. And it also, if you've ever traveled through water, water, either swimming or with a boat, okay, water has a lot of drag. <laughs> so a lot of what we've been experiencing lately is, has to do with that. But the main thing is in two days, Mercury's going to move on to Leo. Yay! <laughs> and, 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 and it's going to be a different terrain. And yeah, it, 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 Mercury in, in Cancer hasn't been a good, bad thing. A lot of people have been able to take that long period of time in cancer with Mercury, the emblem of the mind and its means of expressing itself, uh, and do some very creative things with it. Uh, there, there has, for every person who's been feeling kind of uh, lost or confused or, or scared uh, over the last nine weeks, there has, have been other people who have been inspired uh, and found uh, uh, new ways to express themselves and, and new ways to create uh, uh, options that, that they hadn't thought of before. Uh, but now we're moving on, uh, and, it, and, the, and the terrain's going to change. So in, in a couple of days, a lot of people are going to notice uh, uh, that, well, you know, uh, and I'm, I might be thinking a little better or more objectively or less emotionally. Um, but then, of course, there will be some things that go with, with Mercury and Leo as well. And, uh, uh, you know, there might be a time for uh, a lot of uh, um, self-examination because Leo, represented by the sun, has to do with consciousness. So being conscious of how you're thinking is going to be really important in uh, the next couple of weeks to come. So before uh, you act uh, on something, ask yourself, okay, what am I thinking? As opposed to later saying, oh gosh, what was I thinking? <laughs> and right. So that's going to be the protocol for the next couple of weeks to come, uh, to be present with your thoughts and, and be conscious of what you're thinking. And ask yourself frequently, what exactly am I thinking before acting on it? Now, you working with astrology, did you know that Mercury was going to stay uh, in uh, go retrograde for this amount of period? Is that something you can see coming ahead of time? Oh, yeah, it's it predictable. Such... Oh, it is predictable. Okay, great. Oh, yeah, it's predictable, yeah. Uh, the, 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 these, these, uh, there are astrological tables that are published. They're called an ephemeris. Uh, the, and all of the, the motion on these tables, the motion... Uh, of the sun and the moon and the planets through the sign, including the retrogrades. It's all there. Uh, it's predictable. Uh, you can look ahead of time. You can, uh, you can, uh, you can uh, pl uh, plan to observe, okay? The, the next, Merc for example, for those listening out there, okay? The next uh, Mercury retrograde, uh, is going to be taking place in the autumn. It's going to be uh, in uh, uh, in Scorpio, entirely in Scorpio. The third water sign retrograde in a row for the first time since 1967. Um, and that retrograde will go from October 21st to November 10th. So how to empower yourself with astrology? Well, um, look at what's going on in your life from October 21st to November 10th. 
observation and correlation. Then you'll learn something about how retrogrades work in your life. And then you add the observations and correlations of future retrogrades that take place in signs other than water signs. Uh, and you, uh, over a period of time, you get a feel for things, just like scientists are getting a feel for these flips uh, uh, in the solar magnetic field. We've observed it three times so far. We have some idea of what's going to happen. We have some idea of what's not going to happen. The world, in all probability, is not going to end because we've been through it three times before. But, you know, but there's uh, also a probability that could have an effect on things like our weather. Uh, uh, and the same thing is true with, with, with astrology. Anybody can get an ephemeris, look at where things are, look at their life, co- make a correlation to go with the observation, and then build up experience uh, and, and, and figure out how these things work in your life. Which is excellent, uh, Len. We've uh, the callers are starting to call in, so um, if you don't mind, would, would you like to a- answer a couple of questions? I'd, I'd love to. I'd love to. Great, great. Uh, so let's take uh, let's see, caller four zero six area code. Welcome to the Truth Denied Talk Radio. And what's your name and where are you calling from? Hello. Hello. Hi there. There you go. Uh, what's your name and where are you calling from? Um, I'm calling from Montana, and my name is Lorne. L- Lorne? Yes. Hi, Lorne. Welcome to the show. And uh, did you have a question for Len Wallach? Oh, I was calling in for Patty. Don't know who that is. Uh, I'm, I'm sorry. She's probably I, it's trying the to number they sh- studio. That's people. okay. No problem. No worries. Okay, so I called the wrong number because this is the number they put on the screen. That's fine. No worries. Thanks right. th- Thanks for calling in anyway. Okay, so uh, sorry about that, Len. Uh, back to uh, the Mercury uh, retrograde and then the, the one that's coming up uh, as well. Um, you know, that's uh, more... That affects the Mercury retrograde, like affects us all in a number of ways. And so, my next question would be: Can you speak to the Saturn return? What's what's different about the Saturn return? Is that is that more unique to each and every individual? A Saturn return is unique to every individual. But I would like to start off by saying, uh, uh, Mercury retrograde. We're not talking about effect. Okay, we're not ca- talking about cause and effect so much. Uh, when Mercury is in retrograde, it doesn't beam down something to make things happen to us and pull our strings like puppets. It's synchronicity, okay? When Mercury is in retrograde, it is evidence that we are synchronized with the rest of the, uh, w- w- with the rest of the universe, uh, but it's not cause and effect. It's synchronicity. It's evidence of our connection with the universe through, through synchronicity. Now, Saturn returns are personal astrology. It is when Saturn returns to the same degree of the same sign where it was when you were born. It happens about once every 29 and a half years. And uh, so it happens only a couple times in a person's lifetime. If you're lucky, maybe three times. Uh, and, And what that represents is the time usually that has to do with uh, a restructuring in your life. A lot of us, and once again, this is synchronicity, a lot of us go through a restructuring in our life, uh, in our lives about the time we turn 30. Uh, and a lot of us go through a restructuring in our life about the time we turn 60. And the really interesting thing about the Saturn return is that for most of human history, most human beings didn't live that long. The, uh, um, up until the end of the uh, 19th century, up until the end of the 1800s, the average the world average human lifespan was less than 29 years. So the Saturn return is kind of a phenomenon. Those of us who are fortunate 
uh, to uh, and there are many more of us now who are fortunate to live to age 29 or age 58 than uh, there used to be. It's like having a new life without having to die first in a, in a very real way uh, because of the fact that for so much of human history, most human beings didn't live that long. So working with a Saturn return is like saying, gosh, I'm getting a new life. I'm living longer than most human beings in human history that ever lived. So what can I do to participate in this uh, synchronistic restructuring, which is going to take place whether I participate or not? What can I do to participate so that my new life is something I help to create? Uh, so a, sat a first Saturn return and a second Saturn return are actually good things. It's an opportunity to have essentially a new life that most human beings in human history never had the privilege of having and the opportunity of, ha of co-creating what that, the structure of that new life is going to be. So I, ho I hope that answers your question. It does. It's very helpful. I always uh, hear people uh, referring, you know, um, and it happened when I was in Seattle a lot, that people seem to be very... Uh, uh, geared towards astrology and uh, most of my friends uh, you know had their readings and had their uh, astrologers but um, they'd always say oh no I'm in the Saturn return no way and you know sort of a negative attitude towards that Saturn return even I did that once um, not really understanding what you uh, actually just explained to us all that Hi, caller. Um, I, I, I hear you on the line. If you could um, just mute for a moment, and that would be great. And anyone who is calling in, all of you, if you call into the show, just go ahead and mute. Otherwise, we have to drop your call. And I'm really sorry about that because we don't have a way to mute you on this end. Uh, our guest this evening is Len Wallach. And uh, can we um, perhaps drop that call? Thanks. All right, so sorry about that, Len. If they don't mute, it gets in the way of the show, and they just have to learn. Okay. Anyway, I just want to let you know that uh, one of the listeners, uh, actually there's two of them I'm going to put in touch with you, but one of the listeners was commenting, and this is just validating everything you said regarding the Saturn return. And um, she said that uh, the show is so good, she says. I'm having a conversation with myself over it, she says. And she says um, that her... Um, okay, where'd that comment go? A anyway, she said that, uh, oh, there it is. She says that she was born August 14th, 1954, and uh, the Saturn return brought this up for her that you're talking about. She said she got sober 30 years ago at 29 years old, and she said she feels keenly that she's undergoing yet another change out of her PTSD at 59 years old this month because her birthday, she's turning 59 this month. So um, she's seeing the pattern. You're helping to point out this pattern for her. And she also said, oh, wow, you know, my her grandmother uh, was 98. So her grandmother saw those three Saturn returns. So right now she's just blowing her mind right now well I'm glad I could be of service but she should give herself some credit uh, because astrology is not a spectator sport it's a participant sport and what she did was she participated she she got sober uh, after her first Saturn return so she contributed to the structure of a new life and she's doing the same thing now and she deserves a pat on the back from all of us, and she should certainly give herself a pat on the back because she's working with the cycles of the universe. Absolutely. And, uh, you know, I don't know if, if you want to do this on the air or not, Len, but um, do you have a phone number that people can contact you at, or do you prefer them starting with uh, email contact? Well, email is better, but I'll give you both. Uh, my okay. uh, email address is my name, all run together in lowercase letters. That's Len Wallach, L-E-N-W-A-L-L-I-C-K at gmail.com. And, and then my telephone number is area code 206-356-5467. Uh, you will probably get a quicker response from me if you send me an email. 
Okay. And I've just dropped the uh, email address into the uh, forum in which I'm I'm reading. I'm not in the chat room right now. Uh, I don't participate mm -hmm. in the chat room. I love my chat room people, but I, I can't go in there, but I'm responding to something else. So maybe, Thomas, um, can you drop that into the uh, chat room for us as well so uh, so that people will have it. And of course, it'll be uh, on the archive of this show as usual. So interesting validation right there after you expressed the Saturn return and then somebody immediately connected the dots and said, oh my God, he's right. This happened, this happened, and that happened. So. I love it when, when people are able to make that connection. It's just a beautiful thing which validates, you know, them and and of course the work that's there. Um do you know and, and, and this is, you know, a broad question, a broad stroke question for you. Um are there any new planets or stars that you know of that you're now having to integrate into an astrology reading? Well, there's, there's a lot of new uh, objects in the solar system uh, that are being integrated, uh, and a lot of it has taken place since 1992. Um, in 1930, Pluto was discovered. And for 62 years, everybody thought Pluto was as far out as it got. And then in 1992, an object called 1992QB1, which still hasn't gotten the proper name, uh, was discovered. And that opened the door from 1992 to now, uh, you know, just a couple decades. There have been literally thousands of objects discovered out past Pluto uh, because people were looking for them. And that has, that, there, there's a lesson in that. People weren't looking uh, until two uh, astrology, or should I, excuse me, uh, not astrology, but two young astronomers uh, decided to look where nobody else was looking. And, uh, and, and because everybody thought, okay, well, once past Pluto, there's nothing else out there. There was a scientist by the name of uh, Kuiper, uh, after whom the Kuiper belt is named, and he said, well, you know, there should be something out there. But most other uh, astronomers said, yeah, sure, uh, there's nothing else out there. So they didn't look. Uh, so it, it, this, is, this fits in with a lot of what we're talking about. If you don't look, you don't find. If you look, you find. And um, so there's a, a 1992 QB1 has become symbolic in astrology of, of what happens uh, when, uh, when uh, somebody looks Somebody makes a makes a, uh, 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 a discovery, and other people kind of okay. Well, yeah, there's something there. We'll we'll look too, and then find find all these th other things out there. So there are uh, there are uh, you know hundreds of thousands of objects in the solar system. Many of them are useful in astrology. Being able to do it in a, a way that is coherent and makes sense can be a challenge sometimes. The way it's usually done is you start off with the sun and the moon because 80% of astrology comes down to the motion of the sun and the moon. For example, the prototypical uh, conjunction of the sun and the moon at the new moon. How you interpret that, that, that interpretation applies to other conjunctions. And then you go to the classical planets. Those are the ones that human beings have always known about, the ones that you do not need a telescope to see. And, the, and then you go out from the classical planets to the ones that were discovered by telescope. And those planets are interesting because they have birthday charts, just like everybody has a birthday chart, a natal chart, right? So uh, Uranus was discovered in 1781. And uh, we know the day it was discovered and the time general, uh, pretty close to the time it was discovered. And so we can make a birthday chart for it and, and do a reading for the planet, just like uh, uh, we would do a reading for the, for the person. Uh, and, and then you, after a while, you, uh, a different astrologers have favorites that they, that they pick. I mentioned 1992 QB1. Um, uh, it was discovered in the first degree of Aries uh, in 1992, and just this year, 
moved into uh, Taurus for the first time because it's way out there and its apparent motion is slow. And I rode on planet waves that, gosh, I can't predict what's happened, but it feels like some download's going to be unzipped. I wrote that on uh, the 16th of May, and soon after, Edward Snowden's download was unzipped for the world to see. Uh, so I made a kind of a, a, a kind of a, a, a lucky intuitive prediction on that one. I tried to stay away from predicting too much because uh, it's it's not really a winner's game to try to predict. Uh, it's better to do observation and correlation. So yes, to answer your question, there are other objects and uh, they can be very useful. That's wonderful. And um, you know, something interesting uh, about, well, maybe you can talk about it. Um, there's a lot of controversy around uh, Prince William and Kate's newborn baby. Tons of controversy, as I'm sure uh-huh. you're well aware of. Uh-huh. For you in particular, um, I know I know that you had noted that the, the astrology, what was going on in the astrology world mm-hmm. at the mm-hmm. time that Kate's baby was born uh, was interesting. Can you share that with us? Well, first of all, um, the, uh, uh, the young Prince George Alexander Lewis uh, was born uh, uh, 30 minutes before the son moved from cancer, uh, cancer to Leo. And he was born about three hours before full moon. And if you look at the three most important parts on the chart, which are the sun and the moon, and what's called the ascendant, uh, some people call it the rising sign, and the ascendant is where the path of the sun meets the eastern horizon and changes rather rapidly. If you look at those three things, they're all very late in their respective signs, and the late degrees of a sign are places where things are really intense. So one thing we can probably say about Prince George Alexander Lewis is that he will not be a boring person, and his life will not be boring. It will be an in, uh, probably be an intense life. Now, an intense life can be a very good thing, and it can, or it could be a, a very bad thing. And we don't know which way that's going to go. But in terms of uh, controversy, I'm not really sure specifically uh, what, the, uh, what the controversy may be. There are some very interesting parallels between his chart and his grandmother's, uh, Princess Diana. Uh, and, and there's some indication that, um, that uh, the, some of the problems that she had with being a public figure may be uh, revisited upon her grandson. But I, I'm not sure of any any real controversy. But I think we can, can say that uh, Prince George Alexander Lewis will not be a boring person who has a boring life. Yeah. There's <laughs> going to be a, a, pretty, a pretty, pretty intense person with a pretty intense life. How that plays out, I can't predict. He could be like the rock star prince, or he could be the prince who wins the Nobel Prize. Uh, but when you take into account that he was born about three hours just before a full moon, well, people born during a full moon tend to be people who um, uh, have uh, trouble uh, uh, deciding you know, which way to go, uh, sometimes which wishy-washy people. Um, uh, for example, Governor Rick Perry of Texas is a full moon baby. And when he got up on those debates uh, during the Republican campaign, he, he got torn to shreds because he couldn't uh, make a, a statement to commit one way or the other. So Romney kind of kind of torn to shreds. Uh, and so that could happen, too, that Prince George Lewis, Alexander Lewis, could uh, bear some uncomfortable resemblance to the uh, uh, Shakespeare's Prince of Denmark, uh, Hamlet, who had a little bit of trouble making up his mind about what to do uh, and, and was also a very in, intense personality. So we'll have to wait and see. But we know one thing, this, this, uh, this uh, uh, person growing up is not going to be boring. He's not going to have a boring life. 
Well, that's that's I suppose that's good. We'll keep an eye on it. And as far as what controversy, it ranged from sort of national inquirer type news, um, you know, just uh, about you know the baby being born when it wasn't uh, Prince George, and um, and just you know she's having problems and da da da, all the way to. Um, you know, they planned the birth, they held off on the birth because of the full moon, the super moon, the this, the that, because it was the elite and, and it's, you know, this Freemason or what have you, you know, the Illuminati ritual. And so they had to hold off on the birth until that right moment where the moon and the sun and all the rest that you've explained so that it would be the perfect alignment for him to come into the planet. So anywhere from you know, that sort of nonsense, and I didn't think any of it was necessarily real. Well, this, you know, this is where I was talking about earlier about probabilities, right? Mm-hmm. Well, in all probability, given the fact that this uh, baby is third in line for the throne, mm. the medical people uh, uh, in charge, their their priority was probably ensuring that this baby was born healthy and and, uh, and and that this baby's safety would not be jeopardized and that the mother's safety would not be jeopardized. So if you just exercise a little bit of, uh, once again, nothing's impossible. Okay, so all these speculations, I'm not going to say anything's impossible, uh, uh, especially as regards to things regarding the royal family, we've, we see enough history to know nothing's impossible. But in terms of probability, the priority uh, uh, was probably a healthy baby and a healthy mother as opposed to trying to uh, rig the birth time uh, to, to fit the, the astrology. And uh, this kind of uh, thing is something that unfortunately is uh, this uh, baby is going to have to face growing up. He's a public figure from the word go, and uh, every time he uh, sneezes, uh, it's going to be on some sort of tabloid. Every time he is seen with another person, it's going to be on some sort of tabloid. That, that and there and that, like I said, there are indicators uh, uh, on on his chart that that may be uh, as troublesome to him as it was to his grandmother. Gotcha. Yeah, because it really was for uh, Princess Diana. I mean, the the public loved her, and she became very controversial because she stepped out of, you know, nearly stepped out of a role or started to do things like uh, Dodi Fayad's relationship with her, et cetera. And, you know, um, it, it was so controversial, the whole thing. And um, she was a people's woman. The people loved Diana. She was... Um, you know, uh, down to earth, and I suppose it kind of, you know, upset the palace, if you will, um, that uh, she was being seen in that sort of light. So, and we'll never know truly what happened to her and Dodie. There was a lot of uh, conspiracy around uh, their death in that tunnel when they crashed, but in the car. So we'll we'll never quite know. And uh, you know, a lot of people uh, actually, a lot of reports came out. Um, not to bring all, that all up, that you know that she was murdered by the queen. So, if 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 at all, Prince George is you know uh, who knows maybe Prince George's Diana reincarnated. Well, you know, I, I, uh, reincarnation is something uh, that I am inclined to believe in. I can't prove it one way or the other. Uh, but the the main thing is uh, Prince George Louis Alexander is a human being. Yes. Uh, just like Princess Diana is, uh, you know, she had, uh, you know, she she was a sister to somebody. She was mother to, to two children, uh, uh, and so she had the same kind of relationships that every human being has, and uh, uh, and respecting her on that level, as being, uh, you know, like us, and imagining what you know our lives would be if we had to. Uh, be subjected to such a scrutiny all the, all the time. Most of us, uh, when we have go through uh, struggles in our life or 
or make decisions. They're not subjected to uh, to, to such scrutiny, and and uh, and most of us would not want to be. And uh, that is a, that's a, something that kind of goes with the territory of being a public figure, and uh, and uh, in return you get you, you get a pretty uh, good life. Uh, uh, you know, a, a member of the royal family probably doesn't have to worry about where their next meal is coming from or whether their soles on their shoes are wearing out. So there's a trade-off there. And uh, uh, But the main thing is to see what we have in common with these people because we have a lot more in common with each other than we have differences. We are, we all are all coming to the world the same way. We all go out of the world the same way. We all go through a lot of the same stuff, and to have empathy and compassion for each other will help all of us get through this a lot better than seeing ourselves as separate. Correct. I, I agree. Um, there are the, the, as you so well uh, put it, Len, we have things that are in common uh, with one another, many things. And at the, at the, at the, at the root of that, we all have a heart. We all breathe air. We all, you know, uh, have, uh, uh, love, you know, and, and want to be loved and, um, and fellowship and friends and, uh, to be, you're right, to be a public figure, uh, you are publicly people most people Ooh. could not could not survive you know are you still there oh yeah i lost you for just a second i lost you oh my goodness i don't know why why that's happening but that's all right but at no, least you no didn't worries. have to call me back this time but at okay. least we didn't have to call you back it's all good um now uh where i lost my train of thought for this whole thing um the I love, uh, there's a paragraph that in one of your entries, and I'd I, uh, like to read it. Um, you say at the closing of a, one of your articles, fact is, for as far back as far back goes, most people have spent most of their lives ignoring, denying, suppressing, or outright fighting other ways they have no personal knowledge of or experience with. Please consider the possibility that includes you. Please consider how neither you nor the world can afford to be that way anymore. And please consider how you might break that cycle and start a new one in rhythm with the sun and the moon. I think that's very emotional, and I appreciate that you that you wrote that article. And um, can you tell us in your you know all, already these are your own words, but can you tell us one step removed? The passion in your voice in this article, uh, are you actually, in, in your space and your time, are you reaching out to humanity too and, and, and asking, come on humanity, let's get together, let's do this thing, please consider it. Is that where you're coming from in that paragraph? Yes, yeah. there's, there's, you know, there's more than one way uh, to have faith. Uh, and 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 to uh, fight or resist uh, another person's way of believing uh, uh, really accomplishes nothing to benefit anybody. And that, so that's one example of what I was talking about. Mm -hmm. uh, there's the, the, uh, we have a lot in common, but we also er, uh, have have differences. And being able to uh, to Honor what we have in common and honor our differences is, is really important. We're honoring what we have in common because we really are one with each other and one with the earth and one with the universe where, that we are connected uh, and, and, and we're working with that connection is a lot more productive than ignoring it, denying it, or fighting it. And uh, then at the same time, diversity. The diversity is a good thing. Uh, diversity is a good thing on an evolutionary basis. Uh, the, the more diverse human beings can be, the greater probability that human beings can survive. The less diverse people are, the less prob probable that we can survive. So it's honoring what we have in common, which is a lot, 
and then honoring our diversity as the key to our survival. And the, and that's one of, the, one of the things that I am reaching out passionately uh, to ask other people to con- to consider and to uh, and not say, oh, this is the other guy, but uh, to look at our own uh, role uh, that we're playing both to make the world better and 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 uh, also what, contributing to some of the things that we, we might want to change. Absolutely. Uh, I, who hasn't been on the show in about a year, Mark McCownlish with pilot Stephen Knusel. And Stephen Knusel has his take on chemtrails after being a pilot as a career for his life. Um, and Mark McCandlish, aviation expert who also flew some of the very exotic craft and uh, actually uh, still works in the field, uh, he has his take on chemtrails. And uh, the show is not to be an argumentative show. They both have opposite opinions. And so we want to portray the show, give you both sides of this argument. And I think that's only going to benefit all of us. It's, the show is to enlighten and not confuse. So I really look forward to that show. I'm very curious uh, uh, as to hearing what Stephen Knusel has to say. And then, of course, I'm interested to hear what Mark McCandlish has to say about what Stephen Knusel's point of view is. This is going to be a fascinating show. We've got other people lined up as well for August. Just check out the schedule page. My guest this evening, uh, we welcome him back to the show. His name is Len Wallach, and he's an astrologer. And, of course, he's very informed about August and the remainder of the year as well as the past quarter. And he's going to fill us in on some interesting uh, astrological uh, aspects that are going on and why people are feeling a certain way and perhaps some solutions uh, as well. If you want to check him out, just go to the truthdenied.com. He's all linked up. Len is a regular contributor to Planet Waves Astrology, which is planetwaves.net. I don't know if any of you are um, part of uh, reading that website or members of it. Um, and that website was published by Eric Francis also a practicing astrologer in Seattle, Washington. And as you all know, I lived in Seattle for <clears throat> roughly 14 years, and uh, it, it's it's quite the place and culmination of individuals and um, with this type of background as well. So very cool place when it comes to astrology. Uh, Len provides astrology readings and instruction via telephone or in person. So if you want to contact him, Uh, He is available for you. For the last 10 years, Len also assisted Michael Soriano in transmitting the Reiki Mastery Series teaching model, which was uh, matriculated over 100 practicing Reiki masters. So real good stuff there. Len grew up watching the nation coming together. You know what I mean? Uh, I don't know what it is about August. August is just heavy, really heavy. And um, we have upcoming shows. If you want to take a look at uh, who's coming up this month, go ahead and go to the Truth Denied uh, uh, website. Uh, that's truthdenied.com. And I'll drop in a link for all of you. You might want to bookmark it for the future. A lot of people do. And go ahead and take a look at uh, some of the guests we have coming up this month. Um, again, this is uh, for some reason we've got major UFO stories um, from people coming, you know, forward. Uh, this Friday we have a lovely gentleman by the name of Max Spears, who's going to come on and sp- explain a few things uh, to us that we really need to be in the know about. And he is a whistleblower, so. Uh, uh, Max is the real deal, and I appreciate him taking the time. Of course, on the 13th, we've got Stephen Bissett, and you all know, you know, he's Stephen is under scrutiny right now. Um, he's with the Paradigm Research Group, and he's going to talk about UF dis- UFO disclosure and the citizens' hearing. And there's just a real polarized view on Mr. Bissett at this point. So. Um, I think that'll be a very enlightening show. Steve is very business-minded. I know that he's got contracted quite a bit of money donated to do a documentary, and we'll talk about that. 
you know, what he's going to be doing. And then, of course, on the 16th, we have a gentleman. Actually, we have four individuals who are going to be on the show. Uh, the main gentleman is by the name of Mark Eddy. And we're going to talk about fracking. This is someone who worked in the fracking industry. We're also going to talk to somebody, get this, who is in the fracking industry real high up in management. He's he's actually going to come on the show. And this is going to be fascinating. Two others who also cover fracking, which has become a really big concern in this country for a number of reasons. I'll leave the 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 show to speak for itself, but I do have a lot of questions. Um, and then, of course, on the 20th, we have two of the world's you know uh, biggest chemtrail activists, Mr. Paul Mack of Australia and Max Bliss of France. And uh, you might recognize those names because, boy, are they out there making changes in the world. And um, uh, and then on the 30th, we're going to also have aviation experts. Revolution Radio proudly presents live from Phoenix, Arizona, the Truth Deny Talk Radio with host Roxy Lopez. Join us here for topics you won't hear about on mainstream news, such as chemtrails, GMOs, nutrition, and conspiracy facts regarding your personal sovereignty. Humanity is 7 billion strong. We are the majority. And now, live from the Valley of the Sun, your host, Roxy Lopez. And thanks for joining us this evening, August 6, 2013. You're listening to The Truth Denied. Uh, of course, I'm your host, Roxy Lopez. I feel like we're one big family here on this Revolution Network. It's awesome. Hello, chat room. If you have any questions for the guests tonight, go ahead. What do you do? You know what to do. Uh, just post them and, and our producer will pick them up for us. You know, um, before I introduce our guest this evening, um, we have some strange goings on in the world right now. One of them right here in Arizona, very peculiar uh, weather. You know, we've got some real thick cloud layer, which is part of monsoon weather and some rain which is you know we welcome the rain here we're in a you know 10 12 year drought so all of that's pretty groovy i like it um our temperatures drop from the 120s down to 79 in the day i think that's uh bizarre for southern Cal uh, southern arizona but here's what's more more bizarre We've got this cloud layer that's way up there. You know, uh, it's not real low. It's not surfacing like the mountaintops or anything like that. And um, all day long, we've been hearing like craft, some type of craft. And it's so loud, it sounds like what would be thunder uh, during monsoon. But it's not thunder because you can hear it you pass over, you know, from horizon to horizon about five minutes of this really loud jet engine. And that's been going on all day, and it's been going on all over the state. Any of you out there, Sky, and to this day finds the greatest joy contemplating stars, planets, and luminaries from the sacred surface of the Earth. And uh, without any further ado, I really look forward to this interview this evening. Uh, let's bring you on, uh, Len Wallach. Len, welcome to the show, and thanks for making the time. Thank you, Roxy. Uh, I very much appreciate the chance to be your guest again. Awesome. Yeah, it's it likewise. So, uh, Len, let's um, you know start with um, you know what's with August. Um, why is August? Uh, so under the radar, I mean, we're getting anything from the world's going to end in August, uh, timeline conversions are happening in August, the negative timeline and the positive are smashing into each other in August, um, just a number of controversial August stories. And some people are 
tripping. I mean, they're they're really afraid that the world's literally, literally going to end. Um, what can you can you speak to us about this and help us to understand? Is August significant, or is this just fear porn? Well, uh, thank you, Roxy. Um, I'd like to start off by uh, remembering today's place in history. Um, it was on this day that uh, the people of Hiroshima, Japan, uh, endured the first nuclear attack at the hands of the United States. And it's uh, something that we should uh, remember uh, because those who do not remember history are often destined to repeat it. And it's, that's the kind of thing we don't want to repeat. Now, as regards to um, uh, August, there are uh, there is a lot of activity. Uh, today is the new moon. As a matter of fact, the, the moon uh, was con- conjoined with the sun in terms of longitude uh, about two hours ago. So we are starting a new lunar cycle right now. And there is a lot of activity in the area of where the new moon is. Um, there uh, is uh, the the sun and the moon today are in the sign Leo, in the tropical sign Leo. They're conjoined there, so it's a Leo new moon. And in the preceding sign of Cancer, uh, there are uh, there is Jupiter and Mars and Mercury, which has just gotten out, out of out of retrograde. We're from Arizona listing, if you're having this occur in different parts of Arizona, can you chat that into the chat room? Because I'd like to know. I did get a report from northern Arizona, and uh, they were saying that uh, three nights in a row, they're getting heavy chemtrailing at night only. And um, what's interesting, that was in the area, if you all remember, of the fires, the Prescott and Yarnell fires, the Yarnell fires that killed uh, 19 uh, firefighters. And speaking of that, very sad thing evolving out of that or devolving is that the firefighters, the hot shots, they called them, the you know uh, expert teams that lost their lives uh, that one tragic evening up in Yarnell when the town of Yarnell burned down. Uh, Some of the wives have been going, uh, the wives of these deceased men have been going on uh, mainstream media and and talking about how they're not getting the insurance coverage or the benefits that their husbands had. Um, there's some sort of debacle going on there. I don't know. I'll keep you up to date on it. But that, you know, was such a huge national story that was covered at least for a couple of weeks on all across the board media um, to have this come out of it, you know, when these guys were the elite firefighters and these young wives with babies are are not getting the benefits that the death benefits. So I'm going to keep my eye on this and that's something to pay attention anyway to because um I think we wouldn't this story wouldn't have seen the light of day if it hadn't have been such a big story to begin with. So we don't know how often this has happened. I know that the 911 responders families had some of the same tragedies when it came to the benefits for the wives or the husbands of those deceased. So if you know anything about it, go ahead and chat that in and uh, my producer will pick it up for me. I'm very interested. Or just write me at info at the truth com. That's info at the truth com. And I will look into it. Our team will look into that situation. I want to know more about it. Let me tell you, this month is something else uh, for many reasons. A lot of cul- culminations and crossroads and, and just a lot of informa- 